Robin Schneider, I like to call her the uh, hardest working woman in Lansing right now. She's uh, the liaison for uh, NPRA, the group that has sponsored the original bills that regarding the provision center that were uh, went for two years. They were vetted and then did not then died in the lame duck and reintroduced this year. And uh, Robin is here to discuss the uh, current state of the uh, 4209. Is that what it is? Welcome, please, Robin Schneider. Robin Schneider. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, it was a pleasure, Robin. You know that. Uh, even if you're not invited, you can always call in and just, you know, stir it up however you want to. You're always invited. Always invited. I know Jamie wanted Thank to you. begin to try to help set the stage for what may be happening or a lot of our listeners are concerned. So, Jamie Lowell, producer, go right ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out my exchange with Representative Calton early and then add a little bit of information and let you take it from there, Robin, and try to... Uh, offer up a little image of what may be going on and why we're seeing so the, some of these changes and things like that. But I asked Rep. Colton tonight if he would come on and, and he'd be willing to explain like what's been going on and what happened, um, whether or not he supports the this bill in this form, which is drastically different than what he has originally um, introduced. And, of course, over the years it's changed, but this is a, a distinct departure. And, uh, and just trying to find out what he's doing. Now, his response to me was, Hi, Jamie. I can't do the show tonight. There are very dynamic and sensitive negotiations going on right now with police groups and the governor's office that I can't really talk about on the radio. Talk to Robin, since she is the point person for the community on this. And so, of course, Robin, I'd like to, we'd like to hear what you have to say about that. That's why you're here. But I'm also hearing uh, an additional element, and a name keeps servicing by, by that of Ron Boji and somebody who's very wealthy and has a lot of influence and may be um, a part of some of these dramatic changes that are taking place. So I'm just really interested to know uh, what you may know about that and give us a, a picture of what's going on. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I would say that the bill has definitely changed uh, drastically, and um, we have some concerns, of course, about the language in the bill. Um, as far as um, the name you mentioned there, um, I would say that, that yes, I do have knowledge that he is lobbying for a marijuana distributorship at this time. A marijuana distributorship is not something that, uh, that you'd typically see from a, an ultra-rich guy like Bogies. What's the, uh, what's the appeal here? Is there some kind of a change that would structurally alter the, the, the normal way that things would be conducted from, from grow facility straight to dispensary? Right. So, uh, yes, in the most recent draft, there's something called a distributorship added in there, which um, we, the NPRA, are fundamentally very opposed to that concept. And what that means is that a grower would be able to sell marijuana to a distributor, and then the distributor would transport, store it, test it, and then sell it to the provisioning centers, and the provisioning centers would only be allowed to buy marijuana from a distributor. So similar to the three-tiered alcohol model, um, it would it would basically mean that there would be a, an added middleman in between the grower and the provisioning center. And that's certainly a concern for us because it's, it's not a very necessary step there. Um, but most, mostly because it's going to add an enormous cost to the final price of the medicine, and so we are obviously opposed to that. Um, you know, and and I, I just want to let everybody know that you know a draft. I mean, I've probably seen um, throughout the years, you know, 20 drafts of this bill as it's taken shape. So um, keeping in mind that it's a draft and. We often get back drafts of, of bills and then look at it and say, oh, we're not okay with this. Um, so we are certainly hopeful that um, before we have another committee hearing that our concerns about that distributor 
will be a distributorship will be addressed and that we'll be able to continue supporting the bill. Well, there's a lot of problems in it. Uh, there's an application process that seems to be particularly restrictive that goes so far as to take into consideration arrests, whether or not there was any kind of a prosecution, um, misdemeanors even, a uh, lot of uh, so, lot of things that are were not ever part of this before. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's right. The previous version of the bill had a 10-year sunset, sunset clause for drug felonies and violent felonies, and this bill um, bans all drug felonies for forever. And that's not, um, you know, that's new. That's not something that um, we've ever supported. And I didn't know that, I don't believe that Rep. Cotton ever supported that concept either. Um, there's also been um, certain misdemeanors um, that were given a five year sunset clause. So if you've had um, uh, felonies and like violent felonies, fraud, drug felonies, those kinds of things, in the last five years, you'd be excluded from being licensed. And I kind of think that goes a little bit too far um, as far as, you know, I think that, that li licensing should be similar to if you were going to get a liquor license and certainly not uh, more rigorous than applying for a liquor license because we all know that marijuana is safer than alcohol, so it doesn't make sense to make the licensing um, Robert, let me ask. Some, let me ask him. I know that uh, NPR is not uh, in favor of this middle person uh, situation. I know that also the licenses for the growing has changed in that it's um, there's a quantity of plants which far exceed that within the uh, caregiver system within the Michigan Medical Marijuana. They've seemingly designed or targeted a different way in which the uh, dispensaries would supply cannabis. Um, and then, of course, you have this middle person coming in. Where does this whole concept? I mean, is, did you is this is this something? And where does it evolve from? I know this name has been coming around. This is something quite different than, you know, Colorado's model. That's not a piece of the Colorado model. It is associated with the liquor uh, system in Michigan, the tiered liquor system. But um, is, is it that that's all that is known within the government? Therefore. Or did somebody else come in and say, hey, this is the way to go and this is how it should be in terms of change to the original bills? I think it was a, I think it was, a, you know, between law enforcement groups wanting clarity. And I will say, you know, there's certain things about the bill that I like better. And one of the, those things is that it's a crisper, cleaner, clearer uh, copy and that the last bill had been amended so many times over the years that there, that I there were things in there that I didn't think worked. Um, we didn't know where marijuana infused products were going to be made. We didn't know how were they going to be transferred. Were they made by the provisioning centers? Were they made? You know, there was a lot of of things that were left um, unclear. This bill has very clear licenses for. Um, you know, marijuana-infused products, they're called processors. Um, it has a clear license for provisioning center separately. Um, it has clear license for growing. And it, it's also clear that, the, that it has to be caregivers um, obtaining those licenses. Um, you have to have been a caregiver for at least two years, and that was actually something that I suggested, is that we make sure that that goes to the caregivers. Um, if, if anyone, um, and that was some of those were to address law enforcement concerns. Um, some of it came from the governor's office and administration, and of course, this distributor thing. Um, I'm assuming came from business interests that want to, um, you know, kind of be the middleman and, and distribute all the marijuana in the state. Now, under this this current language, caregivers can still participate, as you said, um, but there's this additional. Um, element in which their portion of their harvest to go to market or their uh, overage, whatever we want okay, to refer so, to it. Right. So there would be two options. A caregiver who wanted to just remain a caregiver, caregiving for their own five patients, would be able to remain doing that under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act and would not be affected. Um, it, however, if they wanted to have a 
larger um, commercial grow, they would they would have the opportunity to to apply for a license for a larger commercial grow. Um, but it's clear in the bill that you have to have been a caregiver in the state of Michigan for at least two years to even apply for that license. Okay, but somebody could choose to do that as a caregiver at any size yeah. of garden that they that they may want. But if they want to participate, it would be a it, maximum of fifteen hundred plants in this bill, which I actually didn't agree to. Um, but uh, one thousand five hundred. You know, okay, so but yeah. to, but just to, just to further this a little bit, so then mm-hmm. their amount that they want to take to market would have to go to this particular distributor, and it would have to be transported right. there in a particular yeah. way, right? And that's and that's a concern for us. Um, you know, we're not opposed to like secure transport as we've seen in other states where they put it in the database and they, you know, they, they transport your marijuana in a secure environment. And I understand if you're, if you're moving large loads of marijuana, why law enforcement wouldn't want you driving down the highway with 20 pounds in your car. Um, but to actually ha- have a middleman who's buying it and selling it and jacking up the price just for that transport, we actually, we disagree with that model, and we will not support it. Robin, that's more than just transport. It's transport and warehousing. Isn't that correct? They would purchase all yeah. the cannabis from the grow facilities. They would hold it and then right. distribute it to whom they decided and who was willing to pay whatever that's price right. they wanted. Is that correct? That's right, yes. So they would pretty much not control quite the whole the market, intent. the whole industry. Yeah, no, it's not at all what the original intent was. And, I, you know, it's pretty clear it's a somebody interjecting themselves um, into a position to make a lot of money. And it's unfortunate, um, you know, over the years, we've always tried to keep the focus on the patients, what's best for them. But we do have a lot of business interests coming in and I, and I think corrupting the process. And so that makes it very difficult um, when you have, you know, eight different lobbyists running around the Capitol all pitching their little business plan that's sure. going to make their guy the money. It's just very. Let me, let me, let me ask some Robin. Is there a place for the existing caregiver? Like, you know, I know to apply for a license, one has to have uh, been participating in the process for at least a couple of years. I understand that. So we don't have a. Uh, be, yeah, so I can tell car- you to be eligible for a grower license applicant. And each investor in the grow must have been a resident of the state for the past two years and must not have a greater than 10% interest. Let's see. Um, a grow. Let's see. A minimum of two years' experience as a registered caregiver. Yeah. Is that an, let's, say, oh. let's, let's say there's a caregiver who's got five patients right now. He wants to participate now in, into a regulated system, be able to earn income, pay taxes, be part of the system. They have to. They, they would have to be in a community that allows it. First of all, they'd have to be an opt-in from that community. Secondly, there would be a licensing process in place that mirrors the state, and approval by both would be required. But there would be other requirements that it would have to be one of those types of licenses. Am I right? It would have nothing to do with their existence as a caregiver other than they would qualify, potentially. Um, take that to the next step for me. What is a caregiver, you know, what is their next play? And, and, and can they be that participating grower, licensed grower for a dispensary? I'm sorry, I didn't. You caught me off guard there. Um, nobody asked, would be a grower for a dispensary. It would be a grower for the cultivation facility. All right. Well, ne- nevertheless, to play that role and er- and the, for the caregiver to transition from what I would describe as the unregulated medical marijuana law mm-hmm. into a regulated system that is being designed here. Mm-hmm. What is the challenge of them to, to do that? Is, it, is there going to be a price licensing fee that's going to eliminate oh, yeah. them? There, I'm sure is there it, would be a price a, a licensing fee um, that would be set by the department. Again, that's something we disagree with. We would insist that a cap be put on the licenses. Um, what, are, what are the numbers now that they're speaking of? There's no numbers. It's it's It doesn't say. Okay. Well, I would assume since they're turning it into the liquor model that it would probably mirror the types of fees that you would pay under that model. That could be. 
just for the liquor license, like you're saying, like a dis- like a dis- right. like a. Or will probably be as extortionate as they feel that they can get away with. Well, and that's certainly true. You know that More they'll likely. they'll ramp pricing up uh, from the initial offering. Uh, everybody gets a soft mm-hmm. opening and then puts it up to wherever they think the market can support. But there's there's also right. an oversight of a lot of other agencies as well, which will will, will and may involve other funding. I, do we have any idea of where that will come from, Robin? For example, if there's the health department needs to supervise and pass approvals yes. for. Yes. So Where there's an assessment. Yeah, there's an assessment. Um, well, in taxes, taxes and fees. So they want to charge a 16% tax on the mar- marijuana between the distributor and the dispensary. Of course, we would argue that the 16% tax is insane and not appropriate to charge for a medical, medically needed product. Especially uh, and then there's also an assessment that it would be paid through the licensing of the businesses of $12 million in the first year. So the licensing um, of the businesses would yield $12 million. That's That's a staggering number. And there's by the, licensing fees? And it's, it's okay. actually uh, too high. It's actually too high. <laughs> the cost of the um, unnecessary process. Wait a second. That is, wait, 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 wait. Just the, the suggestion that it's 12 million. That's not, not a number that you get to from licensing. Okay, Robert, so, where, where'd you come okay, up with that? So the original number was $50 million in the last draft that I saw. And I said that's not going to work. And I gave them some information about some other states um, and what their assessments are. And, for example... The state of Alaska runs their entire recreational program on $1.5 million. So, again, $12 million is still way too high for that assessment. Um, There does need to be an initial assessment so that the department can get up and running, but we just have to come up with a more reasonable number. Interesting. Wow. Wow. You know, this is such a dynamic issue. Uh, you know what I've heard recently, Robin, is that uh, uh, former Senate Majority Leader Randy Richardville is running around uh, Lansing with a marijuana theme in hand. Uh, does he have anything to do with these bills at all? No, he hasn't. I haven't seen him around at all, not even a little bit. Good. <laughs> no. The, so the next, there's no hearing date at this particular point uh, for either forty for forty two ten. We had a close call no, with the hearing and, on, on the other bill, right? Well, and the issue is is that um, you know law enforcement wants to keep these bills as a package um, and tackle them at the same time. And as far as we're concerned, four two zero nine needs a lot of work. Um, and and you know it's a it's a work in progress. And I'm sure as all of you have seen in the draft, um, we're nowhere near ready, being able to support it. Well, 4210 uh, appeared on a legislative schedule uh, for the Judiciary Committee, and then it was popped right back off. Uh, and I know that was uh, based on concerns from the law enforcement community, as you mentioned. What's the legislative calendar look like for the rest of the year? When do we break for summer, and when do we come back? Uh, well, they, they're breaking this week, but um, from what I was told, we'll be in a work group for the next month, and they'll be coming back in July. July so, would be a special. Um, that'd be a special session in the middle of summer break, wouldn't it? Right. They are having a couple special sub, sub sessions this summer. I believe mm-hmm. one in July and possibly another one in August. And so, a, uh, a a cynical perspective may view the tying of these bills together to set us up for having to take a bad dispensary bill in order to get the good concentrates bill. concentrates bill through. Well, I don't think that's it at all. I think that I think that what happened was that Representative Testo was attempting to um, show us some good faith by going ahead and pushing the one bill through. I don't think that he um, ex- had anticipated that law enforcement would be um, so upset with that. They right. felt that you know, I mean, we and it, we have debated. And then the they were successful in, in getting a change to be made again. They they were upset with it, and they were successful in stopping progress again. They were. So they continue to be allowed to just run roughshod over the legislature. Yep. And it's a it's a very uh, legislation friendly. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a very law enforcement friendly legislature right now. 
Uh, what yes, we're seeing sir. is uh, when, whenever the Republicans are in control, then some of those those uh, conservative angles are going to be more respected than they would be if the other side was. Uh, Robin, it's been a, a, a great interview. Uh, what what do you have to say to encourage? Not a happy interview, but it's not a, a happy interview. Great I think, interview. I think Jim Powers actually wants to hit you with a question. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, hi, do Jim. I? Hi, hi, Robin. Um, so, when do you see these bills finally? maturing to the point that they'll exit the Judiciary Committee? Um, I would say whenever um, we're able to reach a consensus on the language, which, you know, at this point, the way the bill is looking, we're not near a consensus. And, you know, I would hope that we could work that out by July, but it's it's going to mean um, a couple of things. The, the groups that are in medical marijuana who have lobbyists really need to reach a consensus themselves first. And when we have, you know, three different organizations with six different lobbyists, um, all wanting the bill to pass, but all wanting it to pass in a different way, it creates a lot of headache. Um, for in, I can give you an example. Um, you know, one organization was pushing for a large number of plants for commercial grows, much larger than what we have here. Um, and we were, of course, opposing that. Larger and, than 1,500, you know, Robin? Larger than oh, yeah. 1,500? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we obviously had to negotiate the number down. Um, and so that's the kind of, of issue is that when you have corporate interests show up and they're approaching this from a how much money can I make point of view, it makes it very difficult to get something, you know, something passed that is good for the patients. Now, I know this is double blueback, so that, that means that it's uh, got Senate versions as well as House versions. Any any rumblings or movement in the Senate at all? Do we have a champion in that House? So the bills are supposed to come through the House of Representatives first. Um yeah. So in the Senate, obviously, they're kind of waiting to see if the House reps get it together and and get their bills pushed through. Obviously, if that doesn't happen, um, you know, we could start working on the Senate and, you know, they could decide, all right, it's not happening over there. We'll get it done. Um, but usually they try to give the reps some time to, to work through that. Cool. Robin, uh, uh you know, there's so many things going on right now. It's very dynamic. We've seen raids in Gaylord. We've seen uh, mm-hmm. perhaps some caregivers that have been uh, uh, screwed with uh, even further north than that. Uh, does it look to you like perhaps we're we're seeing on a statewide level uh, a ramp up by law enforcement, not only in the legislature but also uh, on Main Street, in order to uh, to accomplish what they've always wanted to do, which is to get rid of us caregivers and patients and get them off the street. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could say that that's, you know, a possibility for sure. I mean, obviously there's certain rural areas who are not um, as protected as some of the bigger cities. So I would say it really depends on where you are in the state. Um, um, but, you know, I mean, I don't see like, a, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a statewide effort, but Certainly, those rural areas are more vulnerable to raids. Yeah, and of course, uh, the primary raid uh, entity up there is, stra- is Sane, uh, Straight Area right. Narcotic Enforcement. We've talked about them, uh, but that's just uh, symptomatic of a larger issue. You know, we've got uh, uh, Port Huron area raid teams. We've got Oakland County raid teams. There's issues all over the place. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that just goes to show you that uh, law enforcement. Uh, both out in the public and in the legislature is just really looking to shut this program down and doing everything they can to prohibit progress and uh, really make a model that will suit them. So uh, thankful that uh, we have people like Robin and the MPRA out there trying to fight for the for us and for the caregivers as opposed to these very large corporate interests. And, uh, I would like say that we're... I would say that we're definitely the only ones in there fighting for the little guy <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at all, sure. at all. And, and it's, it's very intimidating. It's very overwhelming. Um, and it's, it's been, it's difficult. Um, 
you know, I mean, some of these people that have their lobbyists, I mean, I, I think I called one guy a jerk and walked out of the room, and it just, I couldn't help it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, oh, here comes another jerk ready to, you know, yep. take, take over all of Michigan's marijuana program. And it's very, you know, frustrating because they weren't there, you know, passing out the petitions. They're, they're people that are new on the scene that waited, you know, for the industry to get booming for the right time to come in, and and yep. it, and it is it is very frustrating and and the best thing we can do is again keep keep rooting for the little guy sure <laughs> and, and i think um huh. and i i think your your message of having to unite is is so true mm-hmm. and it it's something we're seeing on the medical front it's something we're we're seeing on the legalization front and what we're finding is that if we can't get along if we can't come together and all agree on one good solid method Someone else is mm-hmm. going to make the rules, and we're not going to like it. And that's right. what we see going on here. Yep. You know, the, the mm-hmm. discouragement of public participation in this situation has, has been, you know, uh, evident at times. Uh, although I, you can give Rep. Cresto credit; he did hold two full hearings on uh, mm-hmm. on the subject. A third hearing was scheduled and was canceled. Uh, you know, forty two ten is scheduled, then it's canceled. Um, you have to be consistent with your good deeds, or sometimes people forget that you did them. And uh, right now, I, I feel like you could potentially be a, a better advocate for the truth. But, uh, Robin, speaking about advocates for the truth, why don't you give us the NPRA website and tell people how they can get in contact with your organization and support? Absolutely. Um, we can be reached at www.nprausa.com. We can be emailed there as well, and um, you can like us on Facebook, National Patients' Rights Association. And I would recommend, um, now that the bill's been circulated and that everybody knows that, you know, Ron Beaudry is pushing for a distributorship um, slash middleman, I would say anyone that is concerned about that should go ahead and give Rep Carlton a call. Absolutely, and let them know how you feel about that. And, and that's a... Uh that would be more significant, contacting Representative Carlton as opposed to contacting yeah. uh, uh, the House Judiciary Committee leader, uh, uh, Representative Clint Gusto. Either one, either one. I mean, that's that's what that's what a grassroots effort does. You have to call right. um, your own legislator. You have to call the bill sponsor and Representative Gusto. With it being in this committee, that would also be welcomed as well. Oh, well, that's outstanding. They do need to hear. They do need to hear. Um, obviously, we want to be polite and articulate when explaining what our objections are. That's absolutely true, and, and you have to be respectful of of uh, the educated officials or elected officials, rather. Uh, even more respectful yeah. of the educated officials, though. But uh, yeah. sometimes we forget in our zeal to get things accomplished. We sometimes forget courtesy. But great advice, yeah. Robin, and a good reporting, too. We certainly appreciate all that you do, and you know you have plenty of Green Tree support, you and NPRA.